Pe uh, será. Hallo. Is ek hard? Echo, echo. Será. Será. Good morning, morning, morning. Morning, morning. Sê gaf my kaar hallo. Hier daar, just turn around. Just wave. You don't uh, have to formally introduce yourself. Just say hello, hello, hello. Just a few announcements. Stay connected. Uh, anything you guys need, please contact me or contact the church. Um, guys, this includes prayer or every single thing you need. Um, that's why I'm here for. Or that's what I'm here for is to to serve. So, uh, anything you guys need, please do, please feel free to contact me or contact the church for anything you need. Prayer requests, coffee, or whatever you want, or some time to talk. You're more than welcome. Please, I invite you guys. Ash Wednesday, we will have a, a, like a service on Ash Wednesday. It will be the 14th on half past six. Guys, remember, it's Valentine's Day as well. Men, remember, if it helps, I don't know. <laughs> church, me, uh, church council meeting will be next week on the 22nd. Is it next week? It's the week, no. The week dana. The week after, the week after. <laughs> Please pray for uh, the church and for the decisions and for everything happening. It's really, we just want to do God's work and whatever God is planning for us. Let's do some birthdays. The 13, Ruby Berger, Jaku Jacobs. If Jaku is online, I'm going to eat his chocolate. And then <laughs> Ruby Berger, not yet today. Is Ruby here? No. Ah. Uh? Is he on his way? Where? Bef Where is Lord? Can you from here, Ivy? You don't know yet, nee. Any anniversaries or uh, Merry Christmas? Anything else? Nothing. <laughs> any, any, any other? Any, any other requests or any other? That is. That is all. That is all. Um, in our moment of prayer and reflection, I'm just going to ask him our class. If you want to come forward, um, can can we wear? <laughs> yeah, we can from forward and come. Take for me, Mike here. With the instrumental mic. So for I'm so much. <laughs> Uh, uh, good morning, good morning everyone. Yeah, okay, this mic is working. And this morning I would like to greet, I won't be long, this morning I would like to greet the church council. Are you here? Church council members? Yes. The group cell leaders. Want to see you? Okay. All the groups, all the cells, lift your hands up. All the people that belong to a group. Thank you. All the people that belong to a community church, hands up. Thank you. All the people that come first day today. Hands up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God loves you. Do visit again. <laughs> I don't want to be long this morning. Uh, this, uh, the reason I am here today, my name is Arthur, for your sake. And uh, this is our home, but today in Denun. Today we are here because our alternator, you know, if you got a car and then you've got the alternator, can you drive a car without alternator? No, because the word alternator on its own, it tells you, it says alternate to the engine. That means the power of the engine is equal to the alternator. So this is the engine of our church. <laughs> and Jessica is the alternator. He cannot move if the alternator is not there, is sick. Today, Yefro, we are here because our alternator, this community's alternator, it's malfunction, it's sick, it's not good. 
That's why we are all here. If we can all have a chance in this church, I know this church. Everybody is sick here. Am I right or wrong, people? <laughs> because of what happened to you, the whole church feels the pain because you are the alternator. The words I'm coming to give it to you, my sister, may you throw. I'm coming to tell you today is that that family of yours, it wants you first to be strong because of dead you passed away. So I am coming to echo. I'm coming to remind you of what you know. I know your lunch, your favorite lunch in your house, it's Bible. I must remind you, if you look Isaiah 25, verse 8, God himself is going to swallow this death. This death that is robbing us, God himself, not Jesus. Jesus' work is to overcome the death. But God's work is to swallow the death. With those words, I want you to be empowered. And after that, God himself, he's not going to send any angel, any super Jesus angel. God is not going to send. God himself is going to wipe up all those tears in your face. So with those words, I want you to be empowered. And those words are true. That's all I'm coming here today, just to empower, just to fix up our alternator. All this church is with you in prayers. In Jesus' name, thank you. <laughs> God. Thank you. Give him a hand clap. For me, it's a prayer to pray for you. It's a very... Uh, great privilege to do it, but there's a very big responsibility in this. Mm. Okay, sorry. Come stand by me. There's a very big respons responsibility in this. Uh, asking somebody to stand in front of you <coughs> and represent you before God our Heavenly Father. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stand later on. Uh, I just want to mention this. And uh, I want you to pray with me uh, this morning for Jessica and the family. family. Come on, stand. Now, but on stand. Holy God and Heavenly Father, Thank you for the privilege, for these holy moments we are standing in front of you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Hier ons kom bid vir Mare as gemeente vir Jessica en die besonder. Ons kom draar aan die op. Ons kom vraag, Heere, dat u vir haar vrede en troos sal gee in hier die tyd. Dankie, Heere, vir die lewe. Dankie, Heere, vir my lewe. Wat een genade. Dankie, Heere Jezus, vir een eeuwige lewe. Wat u vir ons kom gee het, verniet, onverdiend. Heer, ons dank ook aan die, aan haar vader, <coughs> Gerard de Lange, dat u vir hom ook lewe gegeet. Heer, maar is die God van lewe en dood, en daar die deel het ook nou vir hom een werkelijkheid geword. Soos wat het vir elkeen van ons, wat vanmorgen hier staan, gaan word. Heere, help ons dat ons gereed sal wees. Help ons dat ons seker sal wees. Dat ons nie sal wonder nie. Maar dat ons sekerheid in Jezus Christus sal le. Ons dankie Heere vir sy lewe. Want as het nie vir hom was nie Heere, was Jessica ook nie vir oogend hier nie. Was het nie vir hom nie, dan was daar die twee prachtige kinders ook nie vandag hier. 
Heere, ons loof en ons prijs u vir sy lewe, vir dit wat hy vir hulle kon doen en beteken het. Ons bid dat u vir hulle die mooie herinneringe sal vastmaak, dat hulle daaraan sal vasthou, in lengte van daag. Dank u vir hier die geleentheid, Heere, sê nie vir ons as gemeente, ons bid ook vir Willem, wat vir haar moet bijstaan. Sê nie vir hom met kracht, sê nie vir hom met daar die vertroostende liefde, elke dag ook vir haar en die kinders. En dra vir hulle dier die tijd, ons kom bid ook vir hom, vir volgende zaterdag, by die begrafnis, ons bid dat u vir hom woord sal gee, o heilige geest, dat u dit vir hom sal gee, en dat hy jy sal sê, dit wat u wil hee, dat hy moet sê, vertroos u vir hulle as familie, lei u vir Willem en Jessica hulle veilig, op hulle reis, en bring hulle weer veilig terug, ons bid dit alles in die wonderlijke naam, van ons koning, Jesus Christus alleen, Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we've only been here like five months and it's already like a family, definitely like a family. We've, with all the responses and everyone um, just greeting us and with your love and care, we do appreciate it so much. Um, Let's stand and let's uh, rejoice and sing to Jesus, to God the Father. And He's also here. He's greeting you. I greet you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who's present and is welcoming each and every one of you. And may we answer then in song. You can stand. Oh 
Jesus, God. 
Lord, we pray for your word today. We pray for your kingdom. We pray for each and every church all over the world. We pray for people coming together in all places, all different walks of life. We pray for them who are struggling today. We pray for those who are weak. We pray for those who are struggling with anxiety and maybe depression and maybe maybe deep down dark thoughts and maybe even... I even want to pray for those who feel like they want to surrender today and just give up. Maybe surrender and give up only to you, Lord. And may you take the wheel, take control, and take over all of us. Take our lives as we are. Come and meet us here. We thank you so much. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Theme this morning is retreat. Retreat. So I thought of retreat as um, oh, it's one of the, but I'm, I'm, it's not a retreat like going away for a weekend. It's not a, that's not the retreat I had in mind. The idea is retreat. So it is a, a common occurrence to retreat. I think in the old days it was easy to retreat because your threats were uh, imminent. They were right in front of you. So in the old days, in, in when we were a long time ago, it was the threat was there. It was lions, or you would see the enemy. You would see the enemy across the hill. They would wear swords and, and weaponry, and today, and we would have weapon, weaponry. And we, you would clearly distinguish between who's good, who's bad, who's you, who are you going to fight, and who you're not going to fight. And so those days are gone. We have seen a turn in, 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 in history. We've seen a turn in what's happening across the world. We've seen a turn in war. I mean, just look at terrorism and the war and war on terrorism is so difficult because you can't identify the terrorists. It's so difficult because the, the U.S. Marines and the Navy SEALs, they can't identify who is the enemy. So today, it's as if we live in a high-anxiety world because our threats are imminent because it's right around us. You don't know who's going to hurt you. You don't know who's going to... We gaan jou seer maak, we gaan wat, we gaan wat in jou doen. So, um, retreat was an idea I thought of to say, listen, every single day we have some form of retreat where we say, this is a dangerous situation, this is a dangerous person, I want to run away. It's a natural and normal instinct to want to run away. Especially when it gets difficult. Because when it gets difficult, you, your natural instinct is to fight, flight, freeze, but your flight is to run, to retreat. So to retreat or retract means moving backwards. Recede implies a gradual withdrawing from a forward or a high fixed point in time or space. The flood waters gradually receded or it retreats. It implies, it implies the withdrawal from a point or a position reached to uh, retreating soldiers. So in 1 Kings 19, there's this verse. We have this prophet, Elijah. Well, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Very, very powerful verse uh, about Elijah. So he's a prophet. Now, a prophet is a guy who, um, in, in a time where there was no kings, no rulers, the people were saying, where is God? How does God speak to us? And then a prophet would be, the Hebrew word would be Nabi. It would be a, a mouthpiece of God. So whenever they wanted to find out what is God saying for us or to us in this time, the prophet would speak. So the prophet was a prominent figure, standing tall, saying, this is what God says. Now, prophets were not always liked, and they were weird oaks. <laughs> There were a lot of weird, weird prophets. Like uh, John, were, he was wearing these robes and he used to eat like uh, sprinkona, locusts. What is it, locusts? He used to eat those kind of things. And they would sometimes come and leave, like Amos would come and leave. And they would come onto the sea and they would disappear again. And Because God uses them, prophets. So prophets, and just a side note maybe, I think the biggest prophet today, the biggest prophet and the biggest voice of prophecy today is the church. It's not a person. I don't believe it's a person. I believe it's a body and it's a church. If the church speaks, it should be a, a prophecy about what is God saying to us now. The church should say, no, we don't want corruption. No, we don't want these things. No, we stand for equal or whatever we stand for. We stand for love. We stand for peace. We don't stand for war. We don't stand for corruption. The church is definitely a prophet or a voice of prophecy. So in 1 Kings 9, we get this, this king called Ahab. He's not a good or bad king, 
but his wife is pretty bad. His wife, she's got agendas. And in 1 Kings 19, it, it explains that, that, that Elijah, that Jezebel is married to Ahab, wants to kill Elijah. So Elijah is a prophet. And he runs away from Jezebel, as I would do too if I had a guy whose wife is mad at me. I don't know why or what I did, but if she's mad like Jezebel was, I would also run away. But this prophet runs away. And then this verse says he runs away and he runs into the desert name. So in 1 Kings 19, he, he runs into the desert and it says he, he went and, and he slept on a broombos. He came to a lone broom, ba, broom bush and collapsed in the shade, wanting in the worst way to be done with it all. To say, enough of this God. And then he says, and this is a prophet, and he says, take my life. I'm ready to go join my ancestors in this grave. Vertaling sê, nie my leven, ek, ek gee op, ek is klaar. Ek, ek is klaar, ek gee, ek gee nou op. Vat net my leven, take me away from this life. I've had it all, I've seen it all, I don't want to live anymore. And he reaches that point. Now, it is so fascinating for me that this guy is a prophet, and yet he's saying that. Because prophets should be fooled with the Holy Spirit and full of, you know, God's richness and goodness. And, and Elijah says, take my life, Lord. I'm ready to join my ancestors. And as he lies asleep, an angel shakes him awake. He wakes him up. And what does the angel do? The angel doesn't tell him, listen, hey, bro, get up, go, go some more. What does he do? He gives him some food. He says, get up, eat. He looked around. To his surprise. Now, remember, Elijah fled from Jezebel, but he ran into the desert. So he found this bush in the desert. And uh, uh, like I think it was last week I preached on the desert, going into the desert. It was this place where you completely, you're, you're left alone, you're left to die. Who would provide for you in the desert? No one. No one can provide for you. Even today, some, some people could provide for you if you had a cell phone, but in those days, they don't have a cell phone, they don't have a cell phone, they don't can say, here I am, come find me, come look for me. So Elijah's in the, in the desert, and an angel wakes him up and he says, get up and eat. He looked around, and to his surprise, by his head, were a loaf of bread and some coals and a jug of water. He ate the meal, and he went back to sleep. So the Lord wakes him up and he says, stand up. He speaking of course. Here's some food. Get up. Here's some food. Get up. Go. He eats and he sleeps. <laughs> That's his reaction. <laughs> like most men do <laughs> on Sunday evenings. You give them food, we go to bed. So he goes back to sleep. The angel of God came back, shook him up again. He said, get up and eat some more. You've got a long journey ahead of you. He got up, he ate, he drank, he's full. And he set out, nourished by the meal. He's got some strength by the meal. He walked out for 40 days and 40 nights all the way to the mountain of God, to Horeb. To Horeb. So um, he's running deeper into the desert. But you know, somewhere in the desert, there's this mountain where people have met God, the mountain of Horeb. Here, and this is one of the most powerful texts in the, in the Bible, he goes up to this mountain because he's going to meet God. For the for I don't know for the how many time, but this is going to be his first personal interaction with God. So, as he is, a, he runs into a cave, and then he he goes to the mountain at the attention before God, and God will pass away. And then, as he's standing at the mouth of the cave, a hurricane wind ripped through the mountains, shattered the rocks before God. Now, if you were to stand on the edge of a, like a grot, like a mountain cave, and there would be a wind that is so strong. And I've experienced wind in Cape Town. And not in Rustenburg. It's not that windy. But here, it's incredibly windy. Um, even yesterday on the bicycle, my wife would, because she would also say she, she, she was very, very mad at me because the wind was terrible. So... A hurricane wind ripped through the mountains and shattered the rocks before God. But God was not in the wind. I would think God was in the wind because it's so powerful. After the wind, an earthquake happened. Okay, I would say God would be in the earthquake at least. If it's not the wind shattering rocks, then it would be the earthquake. 
But God wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. Now fire, life, a light. Remember in those days, there weren't lights at night. So fire would be, it would be not a bad thing necessarily. It would be a good thing. So this is fire. But God isn't in the fire. So where is God? You see, I think Elijah was looking for these miraculous things as we do the same. We want to find God, God in, in all these miraculous things, in all these wonderful things. This, there must be these amazing miracles and then we will see God. If we can see this amazing thing happening, then I will see God. If this guy can stand up from the dead, then I will see God. If, if, if my money or my bank account is full, I will see God. Or if this miraculous thing, I will see God. And we see this on TV as well where preachers and people are saying, you have to see these miraculous things. But amazingly, Elijah meets God in a quiet whisper. Because after the wind, the fire, the earthquake, there's a quiet whisper. And when Elijah heard the quiet voice, some translations say it's a, a whisper in the wind. He muffled his face and cloak. Because in the Old Testament, Old Testament they said, if you look at God, you will die. But he realized it is God. And so a voice quietly said, so Elijah, now tell me, what are you doing here? And Elijah says, well, I've been working for you, Lord. I've been giving my entire life for you. And I've been trying to fight for you, and I've been trying to do all these good things, but this woman is trying to kill me. And I'm just at a point where I just want to surrender. I just want to give up. I just want to give up. So I just want to pause that story there. Just pause that story there. That's, that's where Elijah meets God. If we go a bit back into Elijah's life, this is a prophet. So Elijah is supposed to be full of the Holy Spirit. Why is he full of the Holy Spirit? Because we read in 1 Kings 17, we read, Elijah's life is full of miracles. In 1 Kings 17, it says, God told, then told Elijah, get out of here, run fast. So Elijah says to Ahab, there will be a drought. And again, he makes his wife mad. And he runs, and he runs to the Jordan River. And then the Lord says, ravens will feed you. Cry us all your food. And Elijah doesn't doubt it. He just runs into the Jordan and he lays there. And ravens brought him food every single day. He says, it says it brought him breakfast, supper, and, 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 and dinner as well. And he drank from the, from, the, from the Jordan River. Eventually the Jordan River dried up. And then God spoke and said, get up and go further. And he instructed to go to some town where a woman would feed you. Elijah doesn't doubt it. Remember, ravens just, just fed him. He got up, he went, he ran into the city. And then he got into the city and he met this woman. Now remember, there's drought in the entire land. So this woman is there and she cannot provide for him. So in 1 Kings 17, it says that this woman says, Elijah says, give me some food, please. And she says, well, listen, I've, I've honestly, all I have is one biscuit. I can make one biscuit, but if I make this biscuit, it'll be gone. It'll be, it'll be done. Then there's nothing left. And Elijah says, don't worry, God will provide. And so it says, she just found enough, on verse 12, it says, she just found enough firewood to make a last meal for the son, her, and for Elijah. And she said, well, after this, we'll die. And Elijah said to her, don't worry about a thing. Go ahead and do what you've said. But first, make me a small bi um, biscuit. And then this happens. And in the next part, her son dies. And Elijah goes and lies over his body and wakes the son up from the death, from his death. And then he's there. But not in one verse did I read Elijah doubting the power of God. In 1 Kings 18, it goes further. So 1 Kings 18, we always miss this part. This is, a, this is an amazing part. Where he goes to this Ahab, and now you see, we'll understand why Jezebel is mad. Because they believe in Baal, and they believe in their prophets. And then it's this fight off between Elijah and these people. And, and the fight is clearly to say, who is the true and one God? And so Elijah calls them, and he says, bring all your prophets. And so they bring 450 prophets. And he says, make an altar 
and then cut like a, an ox, put it on the altar, and then we both will pray to our God, and the one true God will set this ox on fire. And then in 1 Kings 18, what happens is they do it. So he says, well, you go first, because you are a lot more than what I am. So Elijah is there with a few guys, and the, these, these Baal prophets cut up an ox, they put, him, put it on, on top of an a, a offerstapel to offer it, and they start praying. And they start praying hectically. They pray so much that they start to cut themselves, to say that we believe so much in Baal, it's going to happen, it's going to truly happen. And then it came to Elijah, and Elijah saw them doing these things. And Elijah, Elijah is so confident, he even starts mocking them. He says, call a little more, call a little louder. He's God, maybe after all, maybe he's meditating somewhere or sleeping somewhere. Call a little louder, maybe he's overslept. Maybe he needs to be waken up, pray a little louder. And then they cut themselves with swords and knives and rituals began over and over. This went on until past noon. They used every religious trick and strategy they knew to make something happen at the altar. Then it was Elijah's turn. And Elijah said, enough of that. It's my turn. Gather around. And they gathered. He put the altar back together for now. And it was because it was ruins. And he put it back together. Elijah took 12 stones, one of each of the tribes of Jacob, the same Jacob to whom God said, from now on, your name will be Israel. He built the stones in an altar in honor of God. And then what he does is he cuts the ox and he says, fill this altar with water. Now remember, if you put water into something and you try to light it, it's not going to light. Um, if you have braai, as you have braai, it's all gebraai, met nat out. Did you succeed if you bride with wet uh, the wood? Did you? No. Well, usually when it happens to me, my whole house smokes up and people uh, start coughing and stuff. So Elijah says, throw water on it. But he says, throw so much, they, they throw so much water onto it that it fills the trenches around the altar. That's what happens. And then what, what, what really stood out for me in this text is Elijah didn't do some miraculous prayer. He did the same prayer he did when he prayed for that son who was dead. He did that very same prayer. He said, God, you're the one true God, and I only believe in you. And he, he recited this prayer of Israel. And then a fire came, a thunder came from heaven, and it not just lighted the altar, it, it lighted up every single thing. And so it, it was such a spectacular thing and such a spectacular moment that the prophets of Baal, started fleeing. They got scared. So it's this massive wonder and this massive miraculous thing that happens. That's 1 Kings 17, 1 Kings 18. Ravens will feed you, and he does it. He raises a child from the dead. He goes to a widow. She gives her last food. He, he provides food for her. It, it climaxes to where he challenges 450 pu uh, um, pu uh, prophets of Baal. It, it, it escalates still there. And not in one verse do I read, Elijah got scared. Elijah got scared. So out of 450 prophets, Elijah got scared of one woman. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but it <laughs> kind of <laughs> was funny to me. I mean, 450 guys, and he's not scared. But one woman, and he's scared. He's running. <laughs> So it was kind of funny to me. So, because what happened was Elijah killed all these prophets. And Jezebel, these prophets were part of Jezebel. And that's 1 Kings 18. This happens, and then 1 Kings 19 happen. Why did all these miraculous things happen? But then when one woman decided to kill him, one threat, he ran. He had all these other threats. He had 450 prophets coming at him. He had a drought where a river dried up. Ravens fed him. And then one woman chases him and he, th and he flees. And it says he flees into the wilderness, but he, but he stops. He eats and he goes in three days further to this cave. And then he says, I want to die. 
How can you come from your faith being there to your faith being there? It's normal. It's normal. It is part of your journey of faith. It is part of the way that God is working. Because God doesn't always work in the same way. Because what happens is God did all these miraculous things. But not at one time was Elijah afraid. And then when he got afraid, how did God attend to him? Not in the very same manner he did with that miraculous things. He did in a quiet whisper. In the end, Elijah goes from this meeting with God. He goes back and he hands over to Elisha. At this point, if Elijah were to give up, the prophet Elisha, Elisha, the prophet Elisha, would never have taken over. If he would have died and said, I truly surrender, I truly give up, Elisha wouldn't have happened. And Elisha also did miraculous things. Now you know about his, his, his wonders and his miracles. So what happened for me is, is I had this, this thought that God does miracles in your life. He does miracles in my life. He does miracles in all of our lives. We see that. We, we tend to see it. We tend to see these things happen. It happens. It does. And we tend to forget about it. We tend to forget about it. We tend to say, uh, uh, Lord, this, this problem that's ahead, it's a bit bigger than the one we faced. But if you were to go back, the one you faced were actually bigger than the one you're facing now. Because if you were just to put it in perspective, you're fleeing for one woman, but you <laughs> challenged 450 guys. But Elijah was at that moment. He was scared and he was giving up. It's part of your journey of faith to experience wonders and miraculous things. It's part of our journey of faith to have these faith highs and have these faith places where we say God is so good, He is doing such amazing things. But it's also part of our faith journey to say, God, maybe, maybe it's time I give up. Maybe I retreat. Maybe I should stop. And the most powerful of these three texts or these three that, that, that God, God's most powerful moment was the whisper. It wasn't the miraculous things, it was the whisper. It was the whisper that made him realize that he's in the presence of God. It wasn't all the other things. It wasn't all the other miracles. Those things happened. But the whisper, he met God personally. If you're at a point where you want to retreat, you want to say, I want to give up, maybe that is the point which is closest to the biggest thing God wants to do with you. Sometimes, and with Elijah's case, it was at that point, his lowest point, where God said, I've, I've, I've given you enough. You can now hand over the biggest miracles to come. You're going to teach Elisha about God. And sometimes you, you at this point, and you say, I want to give up, I just want to surrender. But that is maybe the point where God wants to use you the most. No, it's definitely the point that God wants to use you the most. He doesn't want to use you when you're there. Because when you're there, you always, or many times, you're a lot full of yourself. He wants to use you when you're there. Because then He can use you. Because when you're there, you've got control. But when you're there, He's got control. When you're there, you're in charge. When you're there, he's in charge. You know, my colleague used to say, if you were to give yourself a spiritual rating out of 10, what would you rate yourself? And people used to say 7, 8, 9, or maybe six and a half, seven. And he said, well, what should your rating be for you to have the Holy Spirit? No, maybe it should be about above five at least because, I mean, I should pass. And he said it should be zero. It should be zero. Because you should be willing to say, I give up everything now to you. Take control. Use me. I don't want to be in charge of my life. Use me. And my prayer this morning is, is that all of us, is that we discover God, not always in the miraculous, 
but in the quiet stillness. And that we say that, Lord, I'm tired of being in charge of my own life. I'm tired of taking the wheel. I'm tired of controlling everything and making sure everything runs smoothly and making sure that every single day works out and making sure my family's okay and their homework's done and everything's done and everything's in order and everything's in place. I'm, I'm kind of tired of that, Lord. I'm, I'm going to now just serve. Just surrender and I'm going to serve my family and I'm going to serve my church and I'm going to serve. And if it takes me wherever, if it takes me in the desert, I'll trust you. For it's in the desert that I will truly meet you and where I will see you. Amen. <clears throat> Lord, I think there's so many messages in this sermon, but the one message that's truly just for me is standing out as just, you meet us <clears throat> in the desert. You meet us not in the miraculous. You know, the miraculous can happen. It can. All the miraculous wonders can happen across the world, and we could have those amazing moments of faith where it's going well, and we praise you for that. But it was at the lowest it, that a whole chapter is dedicated to you meeting Elijah, and you meeting him where he says, I want to die, and you meet him there. And Lord, you don't meet him there with fire and earthquakes and miraculous. You meet him by whispering in the wind, a slight touch of the hand. You see, Lord, it's not always maybe the biggest things that we find you, but maybe the smallest. It's not always the biggest wonders that we have to look for. It's maybe the softest. I've never experienced you shouting at anyone, Lord, but I've always heard you talk softly and whisper through your Holy Spirit. May we just become present. And to those who feel they want to die, they want to give up, may they discover that this is maybe the point where they're going to truly meet you and where they're going to truly surrender and where they're going to truly see you face to face and where you will transform them, give them bread, give them life and send them forth to go change the world. That's my message for each and every one of us. When we're down in the dumps, when we want to surrender, it's good. Surrender. Because God can use you then. We want to thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for this church. Thank you that you are present. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We give some time for love offering and reflection. I always used to grow, grow up in church, so I always knew what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, but for those who don't know, maybe you just come here and you see the stuff and you think it's just set up. But it's, there goes a lot of effort into this. So there's a lot of people. I, I just want to say thanks to a few people. Jason coming every Sunday and helping us with the live stream and the music. Yeah, I'll give him a round of applause. Thanks, Jason, so much. And for Natasha...
supporting him and also doing the children's church. And thank you so much. We pray for you as well. We thank you for everything you do in supporting you. Yeah, I want to give her an applause. And then for the band as well for coming. Thank you so much for each and every one of you coming. And then especially on 20, I want to thank on 20 who's been here from the very start. He's actually built this church and um, he's come back out of his own free will to say, let me fix you guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you so much, on 20. We, we really appreciate it. Um, the, the sound was better. Was it better? Okay, you all agree. Okay, thank you, Anthony. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, let's stand and sing together.
this morning the Lord is saying you, to you, don't retreat. And know that I am in front of you, and I am the path, and my word is the light, and I am the light of this world, and I will be the light of the darkness walking in front of you. The tree and God is above you, beside you, around you, to keep you safe and to talk with you and to let you know you are in His presence. The tree and God is beneath you to carry you, as Psalms 91 says, you will not stomp your feet. The tree and God is within you. His presence is known. He will give you strength. He will give you food. He will give you courage to get up and go further. The tree and God is in you and with you from now until forever. Amen. This Wednesday, yeah, just again, the 14th, it's this Wednesday, 18.30, half past six. Thank you, Mark Claus. Thanks.